Welcome back, squad. In this community choice video, I'll be exploring how different populations in Middle-earth interpreted the character of Gandalf, his mission, and his trustworthiness. Gandalf is a veritable pop culture icon, and within the narrative he is among the most widely known figures in the west of Middle-earth. But while beloved by readers, in the story itself Gandalf is a terribly polarizing figure. Everyone has an opinion of him, from Bilbo Baggins to the Steward of Gondor, but those opinions are decidedly mixed. One reason for this variance is that characters' understandings of Gandalf are determined by a range of factors. These include Gandalf's own limited knowledge, his need to conceal much of what he does know, the different aspects of his personality he reveals based on the situation, and the personalities, experiences, and statuses of other characters. Something that colors nearly everyone's perception of Gandalf is the knowledge that he is a wizard, so the first place to start is with what it means to be a wizard. The word wizard, as used in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, is one of those terms presented as if in translation. In this case, a roughly English equivalent to the High Elven Quenya word istar, plural istari, meaning the wise or knowing ones. This term denotes members of what Gandalf and Saruman refer to as their order. In letters and writings composed after The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien elaborated that the order of the Astari were actually Maiaran spirits, embodied in the forms of aged men, and sent from Valinor to Middle-earth around the Third Age to encourage resistance against Sauron. In The Two Towers, Saruman makes reference to the staffs of the five wizards, but in the published novels we only hear about three, Gandalf, Saruman, and Radagast. The other two were later identified as the Blue Wizards, who were said to have gone far into the east. Tolkien would also suggest that other similar figures could have come to Middle-earth at one point or another, writing in one essay, Of this order the number is unknown, but of those that came to the north of Middle-earth the chiefs were five. The mission of the Astari was explicitly not to awe or overpower the people of Middle-earth, but to provide covert support, to train, advise, instruct, arouse the hearts and minds of those threatened by Sauron to a resistance with their own strengths, and not just to do the job for them. They were not supposed to reveal much about their origins or goals. On top of this, it seems that their own understanding and memories of their past and true natures were limited as a condition of their role. Being embodied, the Astari had need to learn much anew by slow experience, and though they knew whence they came, the memory of the Blessed Realm was to them a vision from afar off, for which, so long as they remained true to their mission, they yearned exceedingly. Of all the people in Middle-earth, the elves were best positioned to understand what the Astari were and why they came, especially the oldest and wisest ones. Círdan is said to be the only person for a long time who knew they'd come from Valinor since he'd actually witnessed their arrival by ship, but elsewhere Tolkien mentions Elrond and Galadriel as examples of elves who would eventually have known something of the Astari's true nature. Círdan also shows special insight regarding Gandalf's role. Consensually induced mission-specific amnesia aside, none of the Astari entered Middle-earth as completely blank slates. While they all share the same overall goals and restrictions, Tolkien notes it may be seen that they were free each to do what they could in this mission, that they were not commanded or supposed to act together as a small central body of power and wisdom, and that each had different powers and inclinations and were chosen by the Valar with this in mind. Of the Blue Wizards, little is known, and indeed it's not even clear whether they arrived at the same time as the other three. Radagast was chosen for his devotion to the natural world that soon consumed most of his attention. As the age wears on, he increasingly retreats from the affairs of men, dwarves, and elves, making a home near Mirkwood, and mostly befriending fellow hermits like Beorn. Saruman's strengths were in lore, cunning, and verbal persuasion. As a fellow pupil of Aule and the highest ranking member of the group, he would have been an ideal choice to oppose Sauron in his own arena, were it not for his fragile ego. Treebeard later characterizes him as having a mind of metal and wheels, whose only care for growing things is how they may serve him in the moment. Gandalf's situation is a little different, as he was chosen less for a particular skill or specialization, and more for his innate personality. In Valinor, where he was known as Olorin, the traits that characterized him were his humility, compassion, and a certain impulsivity described as fieriness. Warm and eager was his spirit, for he was the enemy of Sauron, opposing the fire that devours and wastes with the fire that kindles and suckers in one hope and distress. He was not proud, and sought neither power nor praise, and thus far and wide he was beloved among all those that were not themselves proud. Early on, he showed a particular liking for the elves. He walked among them unseen, or in form as one of them, and they did not know whence came the fair visions or the promptings of wisdom that he put into their hearts. According to one of Tolkien's essays on the Astari, 
When the Valar are debating and determining who to send to Middle-earth, Loren actually arrives late to the Council from one of his habitual journeys. When Manwe asks him to join the Astari, far from being honored by the distinction or eager at the chance to prove himself, he protests that he's afraid to pit himself against Sauron, and only goes because Manwe insists. This is merely the first of many recorded instances where Gandalf balks at assuming a position of authority, much preferring to wander unrecognized and investigate as his inclinations dictate. Paradoxically, it's this very tendency that gives his political rivals fits. Ambitious and controlling individuals like Denethor or Saruman, and even to an extent Sauron himself, can't seem to fathom that Gandalf really isn't interested in claiming power for himself. At the same time, it's precisely this tendency that leads others like Manwe, Círdan, and Galadriel to place more trust in him, seeing that he's motivated by sincere compassion rather than pride. Upon Gandalf's arrival, Círdan discreetly entrusts him with Narya, the Elven Ring of Fire, saying he will find it useful to kindle courage in the hearts of others. It could simply be that Gandalf's humility makes him the most trustworthy choice, but it's also true that Narya is particularly well-suited to Gandalf's distinct mode of operating. Somehow, Círdan perceived how Gandalf's innate temperament would influence his engagement with the Astari's broader mission of opposing Sauron, and realized Gandalf's role would be to inspire hope and courage in others, working through emotions rather than reason, and remaining open to the promptings of fate and providence rather than executing preconceived plans. Círdan's insight, however, is unique, and something he keeps to himself for a long time. Other elves might not have been so discerning, but they would likely have recognized that these wizards were neither elven nor really human. It's helpful, of course, that the elves have some past experiences with similar phenomena. The Maya Melian took on an incarnate elven form to marry Thingol and become Queen of Doriath, and some notes of Tolkien's indicate that during the Eldar's long migration from Quivian into Valinor in the Elder Days, Maiar would sometimes come dwell among them as messengers and guides. There's even a note published in Nature of Middle-earth that suggests these messengers could have been our five Istari, working under the leadership of Melian. This doesn't mean the elves automatically considered the Astari completely trustworthy, because we have at least one glaring counterexample to these benign entities. Sauron, in his guise of Anatar, is also said to have presented himself as a helpful messenger sent by the Valar. In Eregion, Sauron posed as an emissary of the Valar sent by them to Middle-earth, thus anticipating the Astari, or ordered by them to remain there to give aid to the elves. Sauron managed to persuade the more ambitious Noldor, but Elrond, Galadriel, and Gilgalad were immediately suspicious of his claims, and it turns out that their suspicions were more than justified. Based on this, we can guess that something about Anatar or his overtures set off certain alarm bells that the Istari failed to trigger, though as Saruman demonstrates, it was still possible for them to conceal, dissemble, and lie. All the same, the acceptance of figures like Elrond, Galadriel, and Círdan, who all have proven track records in such matters, must have helped. More importantly, Gandalf remains partial to elves, and many take a liking to him in return. He's sufficiently sure of the Mirkwood elves to entrust Gollum to them. In Lothlorien, the general population publicly laments when they learn of his death. However, Gandalf spends the most time in Rivendell, becoming friends with Elrond. In The Hobbit, as Thorin's party approaches Rivendell, Gandalf reports having earlier met two of Elrond's people who were friends of his, and no sooner do they arrive than Gandalf was already off his horse and among the elves, talking merrily with them. As heartwarming as it is to know Gandalf was apparently well-liked among the elves, he didn't come to Middle-earth merely to cavort. Effectively opposing Sauron means advising the wise and powerful among the elves on some very serious decisions, and it's as a member of the Council of the Wise that Gandalf most clearly displays his opinions and goals. Yet even here, there is room for misperception. Compared to Saruman, Gandalf seems to be more popular with other members of the Council, we know he's especially close to Elrond, who shares his doubts about Sauron and the Ring. Círdan has already given Gandalf his vote of confidence, and Galadriel has far greater trust in him than she does in Saruman, even recommending that he be made head of the council. Interestingly though, despite the enthusiasm elven leaders have for him personally, most elves are said to recognize Saruman as the head of the Istari, a sentiment Gandalf himself affirms. Not only is Saruman said to be higher up the Valinorian hierarchy, but he has a noble bearing, a fair voice, and great skill of hand. It's his advice that prevails in the council for a long time. Gandalf's strengths are less obvious. He rejects the responsibilities of leadership to wander as his hunches and interests dictate, seeking news and information, and providing help and encouragement to the downtrodden. 
In hindsight, of course, it's clear that this is precisely what enables him to be so successful. And even at the time, Saruman resents Gandalf for this. Saruman knew in his heart that the Grey Wanderer had the greater strength and the greater influence upon the dwellers in Middle-earth, even though he hid his power and desired neither fear nor reverence. But to nearly everyone else, including Gandalf himself, it looks like Saruman is rightly the chief of the operation. Thus, even among many high-ranking elves, Gandalf may be considered more personable and possibly more noble of spirit, but still a subordinate when compared to Saruman's confident and rhetorically polished leadership. In fact, for the majority of his time in Middle-earth, Gandalf views his own role this way. Despite his growing uneasiness about Saruman's endgame, when he hears the Nazgul have appeared again, his first move is to accept Saruman's invitation to collaborate. Surely, the head of the Order is the proper person to take responsibility for the evolving situation, whatever Gandalf's personal misgivings might be. It's only after Saruman's treachery is revealed that Gandalf himself realizes he is the only one left to see the mission through. If even the wisest elves, and Gandalf himself, see his role as a primarily supportive one for so long, the familiarity with which others sometimes treat him makes a little more sense. Discounting the unfair advantages of the elves, the person best able to make sense of Gandalf is probably Aragorn. Gandalf spends most of his time in the north, particularly Rivendell, and becomes an ally to the northern Dúnedain, so the two would automatically have been familiar with each other. They also share similar lifestyles. In fact, for a while, Aragorn is something like Gandalf's apprentice. They travel widely together, and he learns much from him. Accordingly, Aragorn is aware that Gandalf is much more than he seems. Gandalf is greater than you Shirefolk know, he tells the hobbits. As a rule, you can only see his jokes and toys. But Aragorn is again the exception. The chieftain of the north, raised among elves in Rivendell practically from infancy, a man of notable wisdom and insight, and Gandalf's traveling companion and confidant. And after Gandalf's return as the White, even Aragorn is taken aback by his more fully revealed power and expanded authority. After studying him closely, Aragorn says, Do I not say truly, Gandalf, that you could go whithersoever you wished quicker than I? And this also I say, you are our captain and our banner. The ordinary men and hobbits of the Shire have a much more superficial understanding of Gandalf's nature. Generally speaking, mortals have less spiritual insight than elves, and at first they accept the Astari at face value. In the years just after their arrival, for long they went about in simple guise, travelers and wanderers, gaining knowledge of Middle-earth and all that dwelt therein, but revealing to none their powers and purposes. In that time, men saw them seldom and heeded them little. One gets the feeling that itinerant seekers of lore and wisdom did naturally occur in human society, allowing the Astari to keep a low profile at first. But as Sauron's power grows and they become more active, far and wide rumor of their comings and goings, and their meddling in many matters, was noised among men, and men perceived that they did not die but remained the same. Men, therefore, grew to fear them, even when they loved them, and they were held to be of the elven race, with whom, indeed, they often consorted. Opinions on the nature of the Astari could well have varied. Supernatural insight, apparently magical powers, and even delayed aging are not entirely unknown in the history of men. Particularly in regions under Sauron's influence, we hear of human sorcerers who could purportedly call upon spirits and wield magic powers. And even in the more magically savvy realms in the Northwest, there is record of skin changers, like Bayorn, and seers like Malbeth. As far as aging is concerned, men with Numenorean ancestry naturally demonstrate lifespans up to double the average, and the Great Rings are known to have kept mortals from aging. This, after all, is how we get Nazgul. So while it eventually became apparent that the Astari were not normal men, they could still conceivably have been men with particularly pronounced magical talent or access to some powerful device or technique. The fact that many of Gandalf's names make reference to his staff suggests that some may have located the Astari's power in the staffs they wield. Gandalf seems to be the only wizard the men of the North have much direct experience with, but they do know what wizards are and vaguely accept that other wizards like Gandalf might exist somewhere out in the broader world. Like trolls, the sentient trees of the Old Forest, and those pesky wandering companies of elves, the existence of wizards was an unexamined assumption, even in the sheltered Shire. Hobbits rarely question where such figures originated or what their natures and purposes might be. They're content to repeat folk wisdom about how best to deal with them when they do show up, and leave matters at that. Their tendency to conflate magic with advanced skill or craft is well documented, so the minor magic that Gandalf shows them, like fireworks, smoke rings, and magic diamond studs, 
might have seemed no more or less remarkable than elvish singing or a cleverly made toy from the markets of Dale. Although magic is a defining characteristic of wizards, the general understanding of what wizards do, their job description as it were, isn't all that arcane. The main service Gandalf can provide is dispensing wisdom and bringing news, and the reason Gandalf is such a font of useful knowledge is that he's always traveling. The elves find Gandalf's constant journeys notable enough to give him the name Mithrandir, the Grey Pilgrim, distinguishing him from the other Astari by his appearance and his wandering habits. But elsewhere, it's simply accepted that Gandalf roams about seemingly at random because that must be what wizards do. How else would they come to know so many things? It's also taken for granted that some of his travels will involve exotic or perilous feats. While tales of his exploits might be thrilling or troubling, it's rare that someone bothers to wonder why Gandalf finds himself in the middle of so many incidents. In The Hobbit, when Thorin incredulously asks what Gandalf was doing in the dungeons of Dol Guldur, he fires back, never you mind, I was finding things out, as usual, and a nasty dangerous business it was, too. During his adventures with Bilbo and the dwarves, Gandalf does a bit of magic, but never enough to fully get them out of trouble. Instead, he acts more like a travel guide, advisor, and professional clever person, responsible for coming up with cunning plans on the fly, like distracting the trolls with ventriloquism until the sun rises, or convincing Bayorn to accept an ever-growing number of guests through an elaborate story. Despite the fame of his wisdom and power, not everyone is fond of Gandalf, of course. He's known for stirring things up and inciting mad adventures, and some people see this as quite a nuisance, including Bilbo himself at one point. Even those who are friends with wizards acknowledge this. Beorn remarks that Radagast is not bad, as wizards go. Barlam and Butterbur, describing Gandalf, says, A wizard they say he is, but he's a good friend of mine whether or no. On the other hand, Gandalf can be entertaining and sometimes useful to have around. Even in his respectable stage, Bilbo has fond memories of Gandalf's magic gifts, storytelling, and fireworks. It could be due to Bilbo's, or Tolkien's, more lighthearted tone, but even the adventures Gandalf is known for betray a certain lack of seriousness. Adventures are disliked because they are inconvenient, nasty, uncomfortable things. There's not much mention, at least not much open mention, of real danger, terror, betrayal, or grief. The worst that can come of getting involved with Gandalf's affairs is that one might be made late for dinner. This seems like a good opportunity to point out that even the relatively recent history of the Hobbits has included famine, plague, and battles with orcs and wolves, so the fact that Gandalf's affairs aren't treated as more threatening is a testament to how good he is at appearing harmless. His occasional flashes of temper seem to be well known, and there's also the vague sense that his ire might be expressed supernaturally. Butterbur, for instance, is rather anxious that he almost forgot to deliver Gandalf's letter. I don't know what he'll have to say to me if I see him again. Turn all my ale sour or me into a block of wood, I shouldn't wonder. He's a bit hasty. Still, even in most of his irritated outbursts and threats, there's an element of humor. Even if Gandalf could do such a thing as turn people into toads, which is far from certain, there's nothing to suggest he ever really would, no matter how exasperated. Bilbo is probably one of the few people to have glimpsed the consequences of Gandalf's true anger during their dispute about the ring, and even he considers this uncharacteristic, saying he's never seen Gandalf act such a way before. The reserved tendencies of the remaining dwarves of the Third Age, combined with the secrecy of the Astari, means that whatever the two groups thought of each other, neither was too prone to share. At the time of the Quest of Erebor, it is said Gandalf hadn't dealt much with dwarves, though he had encountered and sympathized with the exiled Longbeards that lived in the Blue Mountains. But the dwarves' main source of information on the subject of wizards was likely the men they traveled among and traded with. Accordingly, they seem to share many of men's assumptions about wizards, with perhaps a slight emphasis on the belief that wizards have a hidden agenda. Fortunately, we do have an entire novel, plus associated notes, expansions, and tangents, entirely oriented around Gandalf's involvement in restoring a lost dwarven kingdom. There isn't much direct discussion in The Hobbit of Gandalf's possible ulterior motives, but the appendices to The Lord of the Rings include a record of a conversation between Gandalf, Gimli, and assorted hobbits, which describes Gandalf's perspective on the quest of Erebor and includes some of the dwarves' more candid opinions on the trustworthiness of wizards. Gandalf reports that Thorin was far more suspicious than Bilbo realized at the time. You are playing some crooked game of your own, Master Gandalf. I am sure that you have other purposes than helping me. To be fair, Gandalf's response, while forthright, isn't exactly reassuring. If I had no other purposes, I should not be helping you at all. 
Great as your affairs may seem to you, they are only a small strand in the great web. I am concerned with many strands, but that should make my advice more weighty, not less. Notably, it is not this argument that convinces Thorin. Rather, he suspects that Gandalf's wild conviction about Bilbo's participation being crucial may in fact be a form of foresight, which indeed it does turn out to be, though no one, not even Gandalf himself, fully understands this in the moment. Thorin is perhaps not the best example, as his pride and wrath often lead him astray, but Gimli, who ends up as probably the most open-minded and cosmopolitan dwarf on record, also assumes that wizards have their own private motives for much of what they do. Considering the strange way in which the retaking of Erebor also eventually led to the fall of Sauron, he remarks, Who wove the web? I do not think I have ever considered that before. Did you plan all this then, Gandalf? to find the ring and bring it far away into the west for hiding, and then to choose the ring bearer, and to restore the mountain kingdom as a mere deed by the way, was not that your design? Conflicting priorities aside, it's clear the dwarves do respect Gandalf, it's him they reach out to for advice in their desperation after all. Thorin praises him as our friend and counselor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, and the whole party is grateful for his help and quite alarmed whenever he leaves them without his guidance. In the north, then, there appears to be a relatively high degree of trust in Gandalf himself, but little knowledge of or interest in his broader purposes. This attitude shifts as one travels south. Gandalf has been a familiar presence in the north for generations, but in the south he is a stranger. And not all the strangers who are suddenly showing up at this point in history mean well. In Gondor, particularly in the late Third Age, the threat of Sauron is a fact of daily life, and the Gondorians are committed to resisting him as a matter of principle and of survival. This is actually given as a reason Gandalf doesn't spend as much time in the south of Middle-earth. Gondor attracted his attention less for the same reason that made it more interesting to Saruman. It was a center of knowledge and power. Its rulers, by ancestry and all their traditions, were irrevocably opposed to Sauron. Gandalf could do little to guide their proud rulers or to instruct them, and it was only in the decay of their power that he began to be deeply concerned with them. Saruman, on the other hand, focuses his energy on Gondor. After all, it's Gondor that's opposing Sauron most directly and actively, Gondor that has the military and political power necessary to thwart Mordor's advance, and Gondor that possesses the lore and records that just might lead Saruman to the artifact that could change the whole course of history. When the people of Gondor and Rohan hear the word wizard, it's Saruman they think of, and even when he was still a truly good figure, Saruman tended to be more intimidating than Gandalf. In addition to being drawn to power and knowledge, he's notoriously deep in lore, subtle of mind, skilled in concealing his true motives, and a powerfully persuasive speaker. On top of that, for several centuries now he's been exclusively pursuing his own interests under a benevolent guise. Around the year 2760, with the blessings of both Steward Baron of Gondor and the Rohirrim, he settles in Isengard. The historians note, in this way, Saruman began to behave as a lord of men, with the purpose of building up a power of his own. He took Isengard for his own, and began to make it a place of guarded strength and fear. So it's easy to see how people would assume Gandalf shares Saruman's manipulative qualities and interest in power. Another problem is that Gandalf is very often the bearer of bad news. Through no fault of his own, true, but one hardly gains popularity by telling people what they don't want to hear, whether it's the personal failings of a beloved dead son, or the need to place the interests of posterity ahead of one's present safety and prosperity. In Rohan, he is given the epithets Lathspell, or Ill News, and Stormcrow. Rima Wormtongue elaborates on the class he thinks Gandalf belongs to. Pickers of bones, meddlers in other men's sorrows, carrion fowl that grow fat on war, what aid have you ever brought, Stormcrow, and what aid do you bring now? It was aid from us that you sought last time that you were here, I guess that it is likely to turn out the same once more. You will seek aid rather than render it. Do you bring men? Do you bring horses? Swords? Spears? That I would call aid. That is our present need. It seems Gandalf has inadvertently given the impression of someone who is not only reporting bad news but secretly delighting in it and even seeking to turn it to his advantage. This perception could be reinforced by the tensions between North and South. Boromir voices some of this resentment during the Council of Elrond. Still we fight on, holding all the west shores of Anduin, and those who shelter behind us give us praise if ever they hear our name. Much praise, but little help. 
From the perspective of those who have been fending off Mordor's encroachments for centuries, losing loved ones in the process, it would have been galling for this junior wizard to show up seemingly out of the blue and start urging people to take the danger of Sauron more seriously. In Gondor, he is received with a little more respect. The guards do not bar his passage or insist that he leave behind his staff, but his coming is still seen as an omen of doom. Less emphasis is placed on Gandalf's magic powers of bewitchment. The men of Gondor see his strength as primarily being in the realm of knowledge, news, and wisdom. Faramir notes that in Gondor, Mithrandir was seen as someone of great wisdom and power, capable of wonderful things, but also notes that his chief purpose in coming to the city, on the rare occasions he did come, was to access their store of books and records about Isildur. And it seemed then a matter that concerned only the seekers after ancient learning. Only after speaking with Frodo does Faramir say, This Mithrandir was, I now guess, more than a lore master, a great mover of the deeds that are done in our time. Yet Mithrandir never spoke to us of what was to be, nor did he reveal his purposes. In general, in the north as in the south, Gandalf finds it easier to work with people who aren't in positions of power. The ambitious and mighty find him highly suspicious. Denethor recognizes the value of Gandalf's wisdom, but doubts his motives, believing him to be secretly in league with a northern claimant to the throne, which turns out to be true. Denethor also accuses Gandalf of being more invested in defeating Sauron than in preserving Gondor, which is also true. Denethor reveals the reasons for his long-standing distrust during the last days of the war. Pride would be folly that disdained help and counsel at need, but you deal out gifts according to your own designs. Yet the Lord of Gondor is not to be made the tool of other men's purposes, however worthy. And to him, there is no purpose higher in the world, as it now stands, than the good of Gondor. Gandalf counters that his concern is with everything in the world that is worth saving, not just Gondor, and somewhat sarcastically asks if Denethor could really have been ignorant of this. I also am a steward, did you not know? Frankly, it's hard to see how Denethor could have known. Even those who are closest to Gandalf hardly know what he is. Yet, ironically, Denethor's doubts about Gandalf are accurate in themselves. Denethor's basic worldview is that everyone has an agenda, and he sees Gandalf's broader perspective as simply another potential threat to Gondor's interests and security. He may respect Gandalf's dedication and acknowledge their common goal of withstanding Mordor, but he's hardly going to take his advice. Another perspective worth noting was that of the enemy and the people who lived under his thraldom. Accounts vary as to how far east and south Gandalf traveled, Faramir reports him saying, Many are my names in many countries. O Lorin I was in my youth in the west that is forgotten, in the south Inkanus, in the north Gandalf, to the east I go not. Tolkien retroactively interpreted this statement different ways. In one place, his comments about the south are said to relate to the southern regions in touch with Gondor, and called by men of Gondor simply Harad, south, near or far. According to this perspective, Inkanus is said to be a word of the Haradrim, translating to North Spy a name that, ironically, Denethor would also have approved of. In another place, though, Tolkien suggests the South did only mean Gondor and its surrounding lands, and Inkanus is determined to be a Quinya name, translating to something like Mind Master. So it remains unclear how much experience the Haradrim had with Gandalf, and apparently travel to the East was right out. One final thing I want to mention is that so far in this video, I've focused mostly on Gandalf the Grey, the person Gandalf was for the vast majority of his time in Middle-earth, the figure about whom stories and rumors spread for centuries. Gandalf the White is a totally different story. After his return, Gandalf has a clearer understanding of his own nature and mission, and he's also at liberty to reveal more in the final days of the fight for Middle-earth's future. No longer is he a humble wanderer in tattered grey garb who does amusing tricks with smoke rings. Instead, he is seen riding the Lord of Horses into battle against the Nazgul themselves, dispelling their black breath with blasts of white light. Tolkien described the transformation this way. When he speaks, he commands attention. The old Gandalf could not have dealt so with Theoden, nor with Saruman. He is still under the obligation of concealing his power, and of teaching rather than forcing or dominating wills, but where the physical powers of the enemy are too great for the good will of the opposers to be effective, he can act in emergency as an angel. Accordingly, in the years after the war, a superstition arises that he was in fact an avatar, as it were, of Manwe himself, though Tolkien notes this was unlikely. Although incorrect, this was probably the closest that popular belief would come to articulating Gandalf's true nature and purpose. Of all the Astari, and indeed all of the wise of Middle-earth, Gandalf's role proves to be the most important. 
bringing together multiple threads from all over the place, noticing commonalities, encouraging the weak, and paying special attention to the everyday inhabitants of Arda. It's easy to see how the seeming triviality of these affairs could make his mission seem less important, even to those who were fond of him. It also fuels the paranoia of those who are themselves so motivated by power and control that they truly can't understand why he acts the way he does. Even Gandalf himself doesn't at first see how crucial his part is. Only after Sauron's downfall is it made clear how vital were the small concerns that others so often dismissed. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button hard enough to break a wizard's staff asunder. Subscribe for more chance meetings with in-depth analysis on Middle-earth topics. The subject of this video was selected by my Patreon supporters who make this content possible. Check out the link below to learn more. Thanks to everyone for watching, and special thanks to Gandalf the Grey, Marcel Ribeiro, Nick Riallo, Chris Nichols, Jeremy Buckingham, Bitso Bongo, Dorwin Gray, John Love, Brendan Mooney, E. Rose B., Allison Kreutzberg, Frankie Twelve String, Tamara Saldana, Luke, Kevin Gilstad, Joel Bion, Rogue Hot Pocket, Elu Thickgull, Karen and Michael Donahue, and Jared Carver.